Amen. So would you stand for a moment? And I just want to welcome our guest speaker this morning, Bob McCoskery. Um, and uh, Nat, uh, if you can take him over to the side and or whoever's uh, go over there, Bob, and we'll get you ready uh, to get on. But, you know, I've known Bob McCoskery uh, probably for a couple of years. We actually met first time in a cafe in uh, Tauranga. Uh, we just saw him walk. I was like, oh, that's Bob McCoskery. We wanna, we, I, I want to talk to him. And so Bob's a straight shooter. He's a no-nonsense voice uh, for the family, his organization, family Family First really is a household uh, name. He's uh, dealing with uh, and speaking common sense to issues and uh, values from uh, 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 th- that really, you, you'd call yourself a family watchdog, really. That's why, yeah, just to, to, to protect. And he's, he's just a guy who just, he, he's taken on, he's battled it with, with, I've seen you battling it with Jacinda Ardern on television. I've seen you just, just last week, he, with the, um, the Seymour guy, David Seymour, he, he he speaks to things. He's a straight shooter. It says it uh, like it is because he loves this nation and he loves the uh, loves the family. He's he's not afraid to ask the tough questions or tackle the tough qu- tough issues: euthanasia, critical race theory, g- the gender agenda in our schools, abortion. He he tackles he tackles it all. He's successfully ran the campaign "Say No nope to Dope," which uh, stopped marijuana being legalised. Now I don't know. Hopefully none of you are disappointed with that, but 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 he got it done. He's a he's a man of action. He he walks the talk and talks the walk. So I, I, I'm so pleased to have him here today. So I've asked him just, just to challenge us today. And uh, uh, again, we can be nice and safe in our little church walls, but there's a lot happening out there. So would you please uh, a welcome to the platform this man who fights for our families, fights for our nation, Bob McCoskey. Thank you, everybody. Nice to be here. Uh, you can be seated. I have a confession to make. Uh, actually, um, I was brought up in the Methodist Church, uh, and then I left in about 1999 due to theological differences. Uh, planted a church with a Tongan guy called Reverend Tavaki Tupo, uh, and for the last 23 years we've run this church in South Auckland in Papatautai. And then at the beginning of this year I retired from leadership just because of the pressures of this work. And I started going to this new weird church in Manukau called Manukau New Life Come on. <laughs> with uh, Stephen and Susie Miller. Yeah. So, so if you think I'm weird, I'm one of you, okay? So there's no excuse. Uh, anyway, good to be here. I hope you guys can see that screen okay. Is the angle okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, let's open them up to Daniel 3. Daniel 3, verse 13, well-known story. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a terrible rage, ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought before him. Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he demanded, that you are refusing to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I set up? I'll give you one more chance. When the music plays, if you fall down and worship the statue, all will be well. But if you refuse, you will be thrown into a flaming furnace within the hour. And what God can deliver you out of my hands then? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not worried about what will happen to us. If we are thrown into the flaming furnace, our God is able to deliver us, and he will deliver us out of your hand, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, please understand that even then we will never, under any circumstances, serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have erected. Even if. Turn left to Judges, Judges 4, about six or 700 years before this event occurred. Judges 4, page 394. Judges 4. Israel's leader at that time, the one who was responsible for bringing the people back to God, was Deborah, a prophetess, the the wife of Lapidoth. She held court at a place now called Deborah's Palm Tree between Ramad Ad Bethel 
Bethel and the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came to her to decide their disputes. One day she summoned Barak, not Barack Obama, uh, son of Abinam, who lived in Kedesh in the land of Naphtali, and said to him, listen to the, what he said, The Lord God of Israel has commanded you to mobilize 10,000 men from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun, lead them to Mount Tabor to fight King Jabin's mighty army with all his chariots under General Sisera's command. The Lord says, I will draw them to the Kishon River and you will defeat them. You will defeat them. Barak said, I'll go, but only if you go with me. She replied, all right, I'll go with you, but I'm warning you now that the honor of conquering Sisera will go to a woman instead of you. So she went with him to Kedesh. So you'll notice that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, even if they will suffer the consequences, they would not bow down to the cultural demands. Whereas Barak said, look, I'm, I'm on your side, God, but only if. And my question to you this morning is, what kind of faith do we have? Is it an even if type of faith or an only if? Is it based on consequences and we sort of do the risk analysis and figure out, uh, is it okay if, you know, God's going to protect us, then yeah, we're safe, as long as we don't lose Facebook friends, as long as we don't get in trouble, as long as somebody doesn't give us a hard time, someone doesn't get offended. Are we even if type Christians or are we only if? And this is a question I want to put to you this morning. When the time comes, will you be willing to stand alone? When the time comes, will you be willing to stand alone? We live in an interesting age, folks. This is our truth. But the culture has a post-truth. And it was the word of the year for Oxford Dictionaries in 2016, and it's uh, defined as denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to mo emotion and personal belief. So there's a new kind of truth, and we have a cancel culture. And the cancel culture, if you were to sum up the cancel culture, it is to cancel that. It is to cancel the principles, the teaching in here. And I want to show you some examples of that. And then everybody's woking up. And everybody is tending to woke up to left-wing uh, viewpoints, uh, uh, identity politics, environmentalism, um, critical race theory. And so truth is changing. And so the word of the year for Miriam Webster a couple of years ago was they. Weird. The reason it was the word of the year was because... oh. It's defined as used to refer to a single person whose gender identity is non-binary. So if Adam goes to the shop, it's not he goes to the shop, it's they goes to the shop. You getting confused, team? And so dictionary.com's word of the year last year was woman. Why? Because they had this massive peak of searches for the word woman. And why was that? Well, it was because... Uh, uh, President Biden had specifically gone looking for a black woman to appoint to the Supreme Court. And this black woman was asked, what is a woman? And she said, well, I don't know. I'm not a biologist. <laughs> now, I know it's fine outside this morning, wasn't it? But we're not meteorologists. And so the word woman is being defined, uh, redefined, and dictionaries are rewriting meanings of words. And so now it is not only a biological woman, it's someone who identifies as a woman. The word girl has been redefined so that it now includes a person whose gender identity is female. So we're changing the meanings of words, and it's been changed officially. So that's why when our Prime Minister is asked what is a woman, he's not quite sure how to answer it, and there's this awkward silence. Although, interestingly, he can define all those words. And so when you got your census, uh, early, was it earlier this year? You were asked, what was your sex at birth? Pretty easy to do. Yeah. 
And then what was the next question? What is your gender? Apparently, according to the powers that be in this country, they are different. Philip K. Dick, who's a famous author and producer, said, the basic tool for the manipulation of reality is the manipulation of words. If you can control the meaning of words, you can control the people who must use the words. So words and meaning are changing, and they're changing away from truth. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that we, there was a president who accused the media of fake news, of telling porkies. Now the problem was, rather than the media actually proving him wrong and proving that they could tell the truth, what did they do? They actually proved him right. To the point now where we cannot trust what we read in the media. And it's very sad. I mean, I was in the media. Uh, and what they've found when they've done uh, surveys, and this is one from AUT in Auckland, Auckland University of Technology, is that the uh, trust in the news in general is decreasing. You're probably not surprised by any of this. I mean, I can't sit and watch the six o'clock news anymore. Either my wife tells me off for saying bad words <laughs> or my blood pressure goes up because I'm yelling at the TV saying, no, that's not true, tell the truth. And the reasons that we don't trust the news is the reporting is biased and not balanced, too much of a political leaning of the newsroom, too opinionated and lacks factual information. That's right, we all know that. In fact, to the point where the media is more mistrusted than politicians. Wow. And that's a pretty low standard, isn't it? <laughs> and what they did was they actually asked the political leanings of journalists in New Zealand and they found that there's this massive leaning to the left. Now, that's okay. They can do that if they are willing to report both sides of the, f of the story, but we've found that they don't. So, yeah, 65% were left-leaning, 12%. And then I'm surprised you invited me today because, as you know, I'm from a deregistered charity. The government spent 10 years time trying to deregister us, cost us three-quarters of a million to try and defend ourselves. And... What the Supreme Court said in their decision was this, that Family First's advocacy of, ro and role, of the role and importance of our particular version of the family, which is mum and dad and the kids, and of marriage between a man and a woman is not beneficial in a charitable sense. That's bad enough, but it was the next statement that was key. They said this, this differs from advocacy for ends like human rights, and protection of the environment, which Greenpeace held were themselves charitable events. Do you see what ha has happened? Family and marriage and truth is being chucked out of our culture, and it's being replaced by new religions around human rights and around worship of the environment. And so then the disinformation project comes along, and they, I, I mean, they, they talk about all the disinformation that's in our culture, and, uh, and they say that the reason is because of people who hold ideologies around free speech, faith, abortion, euthanasia, cannabis law. I mean, I think they just Googled our website. <laughs> Families and family structure, LGBTQIA plus rights, conversion therapy, and gender. Those things are disinformation. Wow. In other words, this is disinformation and needs to be cancelled as much as possible. Even the Black Lives Matter movement said that they wanted to disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement. And I want to show you a short video clip, and it's from a documentary that was about disinformation in New Zealand. Uh, and in this video clip, it shows the true danger to discourse in New Zealand and some of them are sitting amongst us. So can we just watch this video clip? Do I need to click this on or you'll just show it? You can draw people in in lots of different places. And each of the platforms are used in different ways. Hello friends, as you can see I'm working on my wig be back. What is known internationally as the kind of trad wife set of viewpoints, which is white Christian, a lot of pseudo-Celtic, pseudo-Nordic ideologies behind it. They use Pinterest and Instagram to draw in other women who are interested in interior design, children's clothing, knitting, 
healthy food for children. And it does draw people in towards a set of white nationalist ideas. I mean, it's relatively easy to see. If you see a very beautiful, fair-skinned, blonde or red-haired child with beautiful braiding in her hair and some flowers, just step back a little bit. <laughs> I saw a whole lot of blonde-haired kids along the front. And some of you I know are into Pinterest. Some of you are trad wives. Traditional wives, uh, that's, that's what they're trying to say. So, what am I saying here? I'm saying that meanings of words have changes, meaning of truth, we're into a post-truth culture, which is rejecting biblical truth. We're also into a stage where we don't know what we can trust in terms of information, and our culture is feeding us information. Now, the problem is that it's gonna clash with what you and I believe, and, and so my question is, what kind of Christian are you? Are you an even if kind of Christian or are you a only if? Have you figured out whether you're willing to pay the cost for your faith? I was, I was at the New Life Conference on Tuesday. It reminded me, for those of us old enough, it reminded me of Capital Teen Convention with Youth for Christ. You know, loud, boisterous, lots of music. It was just fantastic. Tiredness, all that type of stuff. Uh, and, and I thought, this, this is like heaven. It was like heaven. Uh, but the problem is we've got to take that heaven in us into the culture and we've got to decide where we're at because if we compromise, we lose our light. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, I am content with weaknesses and insults, with distresses and persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Do we really believe that? We need to in the culture that we live. I want to give you some examples of people who have adopted an even if strategy. This guy was a decorated firefighter and a devout Christian in Atlanta. He did a men's devotional, talked about biblical sexual morality. He's no longer, he's the former fire chief. He got sacked. This is a Catholic teacher who got suspended because she posted on her Facebook page teachings of the Catholic church because she teaches at a Catholic school and she was suspended. This uh, Austin fire department chaplain was fired because he wrote about fairness in women's sports and used the book of Proverbs. And so he was fired. This is a chaplain at a UK college in, um, in the UK, Reverend Dr. Bernard Randall. And he, so he's a chaplain at a Christian school. Uh, and kids with a, a radical LGBT group came in. And so the kids said to him, do we have to accept this? And he said, you should no more be told you have to accept LGBT ideology, then you should be told you must be in favour of Brexit or must be a Muslim. He was sacked. He was sent to a terrorism and anti radicalisation unit, and he was also referred to the comparative of child, youth, and family in the UK. And he's still fighting that case. This Catholic chaplain, he was suspended because a uh, one of his clients in the in the um, in the uh, hospice said, was soliciting, uh, sorry, in the hospital, was soliciting his opinion for his plans to marry his boyfriend. And this chaplain just said, what do you think God would say to you about this? That's all he said. And he was suspended. Uh, this vicar was, uh, his bank account was closed simply because he said to the bank, why are you pushing trans ideology, why don't you focus on just your core business of banking? And you may be saying right now, well, Bob, these are overseas cases. Lucky it hasn't happened in New Zealand. Well, that's not true. They are happening in New Zealand a lot. Barry Baker is a Baptist pastor. He retired, but people wanted him to be their marriage celebrant. He wanted to be the marriage celebrant, but he wasn't allowed because he told the celebrants, well, I'm not going to marry same-sex couple. Kath is a baker up in Walkworth. Uh, she was approached by a lesbian couple to bake a, a marriage cake. She says, look, I'll bake any cake you want, but I can't do a marriage cake because that goes against my personal convictions. She was front page of the media and pilloried because of that. Margaret Court is an AOG pastor in, in Australia. She's also the world's greatest women's tennis player still in terms of medals. Uh, and she had a court named after her, a tennis court. Uh, and these... John McEnroe and Martina Navratilova were, tr 
lobbied to get it changed because she's an ARG pastor. Guess what she teaches? Truth. And so they wanted her cancelled. And of course, we all remember Israel Folau. What people don't realise with Israel Folau is the persecution actually started way before you may have picked it up. He put out a post during the Australian marriage referendum which said this, I love and respect all people for who they are and their opinions, but personally, I will not support gay marriage. That's a pretty nice tweet, isn't it? Pretty inoffensive. He expresses his opinion. But he started getting watched, and he started getting goaded, and people started asking trick questions to try and catch him. And when he was asked about sin and about homosexuality, he posted this infamous meme. Now, interestingly... Drunks, adulterers, liars, fornicators, thieves, atheists and idolaters carried on as normal. Only one group got very upset about being called sinners. And I loved what you said, and it was actually the theme of the church we planted back in 2000, Amazing Grace. You know, I once was a wretch. Because we are, we're all sinners needing to be saved. And actually, if you read, uh, sometimes the media actually didn't put this, only Jesus saves, they just showed this bit up here, here about hell. They didn't show the full image. And so they came after him, didn't they? And he was on his own. He was not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego locking arms together. He was on his own. Uh, and so when he marries his love, Maria Tutaya, the New Zealander netballer, you know, the media says they share pictures from their controversial wedding. Well, what was controversial about it? The only controversy was that it was a man and a woman. Now, if you want theological advice, you go to Raylene Castle. She was asked at the time, because she was the head of Australian rugby, she was asked, what parts of the Bible can we quote? And she said, just the good bits. <laughs> just the good bits. Now, the interesting thing is that during the euthanasia referendum, uh, there was uh, Islamic leaders. I saw this article and it said Islamic leaders threatens Muslims who choose euthanasia with hell. Wow. Did you hear about that? There wasn't a big furor, was there? Nothing at all. You've probably heard of the manly players who refused to wear the pride jersey, got pilloried for it. Have you heard of Hanines Rika or Andresa Gay? Hanines Rika plays Aussie Rules. She's a top women's player. Hanine's, uh, Andresa Gay plays for uh, Paris Saint-Germain in soccer in France. Both of them refused to wear the pride jersey. Have you heard of them? No, you haven't. Why? Because they're Muslim. So this is a key point. It's not necessarily what your view is or what your belief is. It's what it's based on. Because Western culture is trying to destroy the foundation of what drives our culture what has founded our culture, the values. They want to replace it with a new religion. Sonny Bill Williams never got in trouble because he didn't want to wear the name of Banks on his shirt. Uh, this cricketer, an Australian cricketer, never got in trouble because he uh, didn't want to wear alcohol advertising. Both were Muslims, but both seemed to get a free pass. But Andrew Thorburn, when he became the CEO of the rugby club in Australia... Uh, he was out within 24 hours. Why? Because he went to a church that preached what? Scriptural truth. And this is a hospital in Canberra that has recently just been taken over by the government of the ACT state because it won't practice abortion and euthanasia. It's not the only hospital in the state, so there are options. But the state has basically purchased this Catholic hospital and the first thing they did was remove the cross. This chaplain was banned from wearing a cross as he volunteered at the hospice. He wasn't carrying around this massive one that you can see there. No, let me show you the cross that he was wearing. That's how offensive the cross is, even at that size. When the time comes... Will you be willing to stand alone? See, because my warning to us is that if we're living a Christian faith and living by this truth, we're going to clash with the culture at some stage. And you may not go looking for it. Like, I can go looking for it because I've been cancelled already, so it's quite freeing. <laughs> but 
you may not go looking for the fight, but I think in the way the culture is going, the heat is being turned up, and it'll come looking for you. If you're living your faith in your everyday life, you, it'll come to the point where you have to decide. Uh, and um, I did have a scripture, but I'll, just for time's sake, I just want to remind you of the story of Esther, because I've told you about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and about uh, Barak. And I know you ladies are sitting there, your trad mums are sitting there who are into Pinterest and braiding your daughters here, and you're thinking you're off the hook. But, you know, Esther, remember the story of Esther? And she was told, perhaps you were born for such a time as this. Ladies, you need to make a stand. We are arguing over what you are. What is a woman? It's the most controversial thing. We tried to place full-page ads in newspapers. All the editors of the major newspapers got together and cancelled our ad, simply for asking what is a woman and saying we need a public debate. For such a time as this woman, we need you to stand up, to speak up for the unborn child, because if anybody knows what it's like to, to, to birth and to, to hold an unborn child, you do. We need to hear your voice for such a time as this. Look, my question to you this morning is, I'm not going to tell you how you should respond. But my question is, what are you going to do when you're put in this position where you have to make a decision, where you're told to bow down to the culture, where you're told to bow down to diversity, equity and inclusion, the new deity, DEI? What are you going to do? What are you going to do when you're told that you have to observe Pink Shirt Day, which in effect is simply uplifting and promoting LGBT. What are you going to do if you're in school with the school's Pride Week? What about when you have to wear the lanyards or the badges and some workplaces are requiring those or they're telling you to put personal pronouns on your email signature? Do you go with that or do you not? And you can say, I'll say no, but what about if there's a consequence? And there have been consequences for some people. If you're a teacher, and there may be some teachers amongst you, how do you deal with the situation where you've got a biological boy in front of you, but you've got to call her a she and a her, or even a they, them, or a ze, zer, because that's their preferred pronouns. And where you're not allowed to say boys or girls anymore as the Ministry of Ed is telling schools to try and avoid. This teacher in the UK was uh, banned from his profession because he misgendered a pupil simply because he said, well done, girls, to a group, and there happened to be a transgender boy, which is a biological girl. Now, we've had a New Zealand example of that, of a teacher who lost his licence because he refused to tell a biological lie. Are we willing to pay the cost, even if? Or is it only if? Only if, God, you make it kind of a soft landing. Because there is this clash in the culture where <clears throat> scriptural truth is competing with what the culture says is truth. And we need to decide what we're doing. If you're a teacher, you've got to teach these uh, definitions asexual, bisexual, cisgender, heteronormativity, intersex, non-binary, pansexual, sex assigned at birth, transitioning, transsexual. Teachers, do you teach that? Do you follow the curriculum? Or do you make a stand for truth? Do you teach critical theory where you have to check your privilege at the door and if you're someone like Adam who's able-bodied in that age, Christian, cis male, heterosexual, upper class and white, I mean... Mate, you are, your intersectionality of Adam is just, mate, you are responsible for every single problem in New Zealand, <laughs> according to critical race theory. Do you teach that or do we teach what scripture says that we are one? If any of you are medical professionals, my wife is a nurse, if any of you are medical professionals, what happens when you're rostered for the abortion, for the euthanasia? What happens when they introduce euthanasia at maybe the local hospice, as we have at our local hospice? Or when you're rostered for a transgender operation where they're chopping off healthy body parts? 
How do you respond to that? I guess what I'm saying to you this morning is I think we need to think in advance because like I say, you may not go looking for it, but it may come to you at some stage. And I, I, want, I want to encourage you to say, are you a Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego? Are you going to say, look, I believe God will protect me, but even if he doesn't, I'm happy to pay the consequences. I will not bow down to the culture. The ironic part was that Jesus was with them in the fire. This doctor was fired after sending a prayer to colleagues uh, and it was to raise their spirits uh, during a really tough time. He just sent a prayer around and he got sacked. This ch hospital chief in Poland was fired for refusing abortion on religious grounds. There are lots of examples all around the world. This uh, renowned public health expert is also a lay minister and he was fired because he preached sermons at his church and guess what he preached out of? Scripture. scripture. So he was fired even though his medical professional and professionalism was <coughs> right up there at the top. And of course we all remember the National MP who celebrated the overturning of Roe v. Wade where they recognised that the unborn child actually has a right to live and he got instructed to pull that tweet down. And politicians still refer to that, how atrocious it was that the National MP Simon O'Connor put that up. Today is a good day when we recognise the unborn child. And of course, there's Bethlehem College. And the Ministry of Education is still after Bethlehem College. Why? Because Bethlehem College is a Christian school founded on Christian DNA that teaches marriage as a man and a woman teaches that you are born male or female, teaches that we are one, that we're not divided by oppressed and, and oppressed and um, the oppressor as critical race theory does. And so they're paying the cost. The good news is that Bethlehem College are taking a stand. But what is the cost? This particular school tells kids that there are 112 genders and over 200 sexualities. As a New Zealand school. But this is what's being taught in the curriculum and we wonder why our kids are so stressed. Although, here's a school that the Ministry of Education wasn't interested in. It's St Hilda's down in Dunedin. And uh, you probably can't read it. Let me just read it. It's, it's basically during Trinity Week. Uh, was it the same week as Pride Week? And so they put out a newsletter. This is a Christian school that said... The Trinity is about three, not about two. Western society has been dominated by binaries, pairs of opposites, where there's often a hierarchy such as men and women, heaven and earth, right and wrong. Yet in the Trinity, we have three. Two-ness has been ambushed by three-ness. And this reminds us that life is much more about diversity. It is not black and white, but a rainbow. I read recently that while it might take two to tango, it takes three to be divine. Pride Week is the perfect week to celebrate the Trinity. The Ministry of Education aren't interested in that school. They're only interested in Bethlehem College. Wow. And yet I think that school is more away from its calling. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego had the perfect excuses in my view. They could have said we will fall down but not actually worship the idol. Or we won't become idol worshippers but we'll worship it this time and ask God for forgiveness. Or they could have said the king has absolute power and we must obey him. These are all excuses we can use in the culture today. The king appointed us, we owe this to him, we owe it to our boss. They could have said, this is a foreign land, God will excuse us for following the customs of the land, following the customs of the culture. Could have said our ancestors set up idols in God's temple, this isn't half as bad. They could have said, we're not hurting anybody by bowing down to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. They could have said, if we get ourselves killed and some pagans take our position, they won't help our people in exile. They could have said, what would Jesus do? Which seems to be a bit of a cop-out statement when you really don't know the answer. We shouldn't judge others, which is not what Scripture says. It just says, judge with the same yardstick that you want to be judged by. We need to be kind. And they could have said we should be defined by our love, our love of Nebuchadnezzar's statue. 
There's lots of excuses I think we can make. We can argue with ourselves. But I think we need to be like Nebuchadnezzar and be quite black and white and say, even if we will not bow down to the culture. What's your cultural fire? What's your fiery furnace that I think could get you in trouble? Well, it's based around scripture. It might be your view of marriage, your view of gender and biology, your view of homosexuality. In fact, your view of all sexual sin, sex before marriage, adultery, sleeping around, pornography. It might be your view of abortion. If you're at university, my daughter is first year BA at Auckland University, huge pressure to be woke. Just indoctrination of wokeness. In fact, we have fun every dinner deconstructing the wokeness that has been indoctrinated in her. The good news is that she knows it's woke as well. For young people, maybe your choice on drugs and how you party and decisions you make amongst your peers. It may be your view of critical theory that actually it divides rather than unites people. Maybe your view of the local diversity, equity and inclusion. And if any of you have been to a session on DEI at your workplace, you'll know that that's probably the last place that you should bring up scriptural truth because that's sure to get you in trouble because it's competing. It's, it is the new deity, the new God in town. Let me just, uh, just finish. I just want to tell you a quick story in two minutes. You've seen the movie Dunkirk? Great story. The, the story behind it is fascinating because in 1940, in the, in the Second World War, the Allied troops were caught on the beach at Dunkirk. And there was about half a million troops there, English and French, and they were trapped. And the Nazis were coming for them. Hitler was going to obliterate them all and have a great victory. And the word went out to the English that they were in dire trouble. Now, some of the politicians tried to do a compromise with the Germans, with Hitler, tried to negotiate. But most political leaders and the media and church leaders called for the people of England to pray. So this is them trapped on the beach. And this is the picture of the queues of people outside churches to pray for these people who were trapped on the beach at Dunkirk. Now, it's said that the night before that, they were still using Morse code in a simple three word message came through from one of the captains who was with the troops at Dunkirk. And the three words were, but if not, but if not. And the people immediately recognized what that message meant. It was the King James version of the scripture that we're focused on. Even if, but if not, same thing. And what it did was it reminded the English, yes, God can help us pull off a miracle. We need to be bold. We need to stand up to this tyrant enemy. And so what did they do? They organized every private boat, every ship they could find, and went over to rescue uh, as many people as they could. And, and a couple of miracles happened. For some reason, Hitler called off the attack because he wanted to have more glory, so he delayed the attack on the beach. There was a cloud cover. There was uh, terrible weather, which made actually flying in and shooting all the Allied forces harder for the Nazis. And the water went particularly uh, glassy. So a number of miracles. And as a result, 330,000 of those troops were saved. And why was that? It was because the culture knew scriptural truth. And they acted on it. And they acted on it to their risk. It was a risky thing. But it gave them strength and courage. 
And that's what it does. When you're faced with your even if situation, scriptural truth needs to give you your courage. So I leave you with, are you an even if or a only if? I want to encourage you this morning, in the culture that is heating up, that is becoming more hostile to what you and I believe, to the values that we hold dear, including who we are created as male and female, marriage being one man, one woman, that we're united as one, that we're not divided by critical theory, that you just cannot be the opposite sex no matter how much you may desire it. We need to understand that we need to make that stand. And so Isaiah 43 says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Isaiah 43. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. That's not a popular message for Christians, but we need to understand it's part and parcel. If you leave your children a world where you never stood up, they'll inherit a world where they can't. And I leave you with my favorite quote from Billy Graham, who said, Courage is contagious. When a brave man takes a stand, the spines of others are stiffened. When you and I take a stand, we actually stiffen the spines of others around us. Because often people are just looking for someone to make that stand, to take that lead. Even if. When the time comes, will you be willing to stand? And when the time comes, will you be willing to stand even if it's alone? Can I just ask you to bow your heads and just for a minute, just figure out what is your response to what you've heard this morning? pray that you would again grant thy servants boldness to preach your word we can't expect better treatment than our master had if they hated him they will hate us also give us wisdom how to live in this crazy woke weird and wonderful world knowing that you, we have not been given a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. God, help us to stand as the time is coming. Amen. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you for the stand that you make for families all over the nation to say what needs to be said. Again, just, uh, come on, one more time. Just thank, thank you. That's an amazing job, amazing job, amazing job, and really challenging, uh, challenging message to, again, just be ma making us aware of where things are at, and we so appreciate that. Every church in New Zealand needs to hear, needs to hear that, and um, thank you for all you do. Hey, would you stand up just as we close? The service is over. If you need prayer for anything, is that? Step prayer station over here with people ready to pray with and for you. Meet Bob in the foyer, talk to him, catch up, ask him uh, if you've got questions. Uh, uh, ask him, what about this? What about uh, that? He's online. You can see his interviews and things that he does with, with politicians and all kinds of people. It's, it's some, it's some good, good watching uh, stuff there. But thank you, Bob. Can we give Jesus one more clap of praise? And He who fears God has nothing else to fear. Fear God. Fear Him and Him only. God bless. The service is over. Turn to the person next to you and say, 
that was an important message I want to talk to you about it could you please buy me a coffee and we're gonna we're gonna hang and do that all right